Hi everyone, and welcome to our Climate Conversations, How Museums Can Engage in Public Dialogue About Climate Change. This is a panel for the Green Museum Seminar for the California Association of Museums, adapted from a conference panel that we put together this past March for CAM in Los Angeles. We're really excited to talk with all of you today about this issue. I'm gonna introduce our speakers for today's session. We'll be hearing from Susan McWhorter, who is a science educator at the California Academy of Sciences. David Burton, who is the director of the Grace Hudson Museum and Sun House in Ukiah, California. And Libby Elwood, who is the global communications manager for iDigBio. Myself as the moderator, I'm Paige Ladozinski. I'm the director of the Global Museum at San Francisco State University. So why climate change? A recent study from Yale University reveals that a major way to help in the fight against climate change is simply to talk about it. As quoted in the article, caring about the climate crisis can often feel like a lonely and helpless burden, but it doesn't have to be that way. Simply talking about climate change with your friends and family can help raise awareness about the issue and actually make a big difference. Communication is key to engagement with the issue of climate change. The more people are informed, the more likely they are to consider their own actions or contribute to policy decisions. So our responsibility is museums. How do we fit into this conversation? As centers for informal learning, we have the capacity to create conversations about topics that you might not be getting in public school or just your daily life. Museums play a huge role in informal dialogue being community centers and places to discuss issues that you might not otherwise be able to talk about. Even museums themselves have shifted. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, which actually coincided with the time period of the first Earth Day being established, museums began to depart from simply showcasing natural curiosities to being more committed to fostering a conservation ethic amongst their visitors. As trusted sources of knowledge, we have a responsibility to communicate critical issues to our publics. However, it's not just natural history museums and science centers that can communicate about climate change. More and more museums are starting to develop exhibits and programs on this topic. This is an image here of a climate change exhibit at the Harvard Museum of Natural History. That draws on our latest scientific knowledge about our warming climate, global and local consequences, and how to reduce fossil fuel emissions that cause and prepare for its effects. But you don't have to be a science museum to do this. Many art museums and history museums, cultural museums, interdisciplinary museums are starting to think about how they can communicate with their visitors about climate change. And even if you're not developing an exhibit or doing a particular program, you can still communicate messaging about the topic. For example, think about how many of you have drinking fountains in your own museums. The image on the left, I'm gonna borrow from my colleague's institution, the California Academy of Sciences. This is a label panel above the drinking fountain um, within that institution, which just causes the visitor to take pause and think a little bit more about bottled water and how much oil that requires people to consume um, and how reducing oil really helps us fight against climate change. This isn't even a label in an exhibit, it's just hanging above a drinking fountain, but think about that powerful message. The middle image is a painting from a climate change exhibition at the Henry Sheldon Art Museum in Vermont. This is a small local art museum, one that you might not necessarily think would have an exhibition about climate change, um, but this one is called The Animals Are Innocent, and it focuses on the works of a local Vermont artist whose work specifically focuses on species who are facing extinction due to climate change. And lastly, the image on the right is of the 2017 Venice Biennale sculpture that's titled Support. These huge hands rise out of the water, gripping a 14th century hotel as a statement on the impacts of climate change. So before I turn it over to my colleagues to speak in more detail, I wanted to share an example from my institution. We're a small university museum with just three staff. Um, we have cultural collections consisting of material from across the globe, ranging from archaeological to contemporary. Our recent exhibition, Climate Stories, focuses on the impacts of climate change on indigenous communities across the globe. We wanted to think about new ways to reframe our collections. 
So we think about how can we communicate these objects in a message that really represents an issue that's happening today, something that resonates with our primary audience, students, and one that is gonna encourage our visitors to care about the issue. So we take objects such as, for example, this carved walrus tusk. This is a native Alaskan walrus tusk from the early 20th century depicting a traditional hunting scene, which is on loan from the Cal Academy. The label panel talks about how today, native Alaskan hunters have adapted new methods, including flying drones over ancestral hunting grounds to track sea ice and walrus populations, because that traditional way of life has been really altered by climate change. We talk about relationships with wildlife, connections to the ocean, adapting tradition, how communities are thinking about solutions and adapting to these changes in both their environments, but also their cultural traditions. So this is an interesting way to talk about this issue um, in a different setting, focusing on community dialogue, on cultural collections, on connections that we can make with students and our visitors. And of course, we've all had to make a lot of changes in the past few months due to COVID. Um, and everything that's going on right now. But I did wanna mention a study that came out in May of this year. Americans see climate as a concern even amidst the coronavirus crisis. So it's not something that's gonna go away. Um, in our response, we adapted this Climate Stories exhibition into a new virtual exhibit that we just launched on our website. And we also started to create new online education materials that we can share with parents and teachers. The image on the left is of one of our graduate students in the museum studies program who demonstrates an at-home art activity themed around abalone, which is an environmentally and culturally significant species um, around the world, but also here in the Bay Area. So those are a few of the programs and projects we have going on in my institution for the rest of the panel. I'm looking forward to hearing more from my colleagues about what some other museums are doing, from science museums, to art and history museums, to even in the digital sphere. So I'll stop my screen now and turn it over to Susan. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Paige. I'm very excited to be a part of this discussion. And today, I thought I would give you an example of how we talk about climate change at the California Academy. Um, describe some of the props we use, and then I'll get into the actual framework or structure of a climate change conversation. So there's our museum in um, Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Inside the museum, we have a planetarium, a rainforest, an aquarium downstairs, and on the top, we've got a beautiful green roof. But let's get started right away with our climate change conversation. So I'd like to start by looking at this photo. What do you see? How does it make you feel? Any emotions, memories, desires? Take a moment to think and then you can share in the chat box if you like. So when I look at this photo, I um, definitely feel an emotion. This is um, a a photo of a place I know very well. It's a photo from the Philippine coral reef tank in the aquarium at the Cal Academy. It's a model of one of the most biodiverse reefs in the world. And scientists at the Cal Academy are working hard to learn as much as they can about this reef to help protect it for future generations. So why should we care about an iconic ecosystem such as this one? Well, thriving coral reefs provide billions of people with food, protect our coastlines from storms, and provide habitat for one quarter of all life in our oceans. And of course, they're also vibrant places for us all to explore. So it turns out um, these reefs are in need of our help now. And 
while we try to protect them, each one of us, or would like to protect them, we're inadvertently harming them. When we burn fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, natural gas, we release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this carbon dioxide acts like a thickening of a heat trapping blanket that encircles our earth. And as we burn more fossil fuel, we release more and more carbon dioxide and that heat trapping blanket gets even thicker. Our planet gets warmer and so do our ocean waters. So let's explore a little what happens to our coral reefs as the ocean gets warmer. So here we have some props that we have developed to help guests on the public floor and students in our classrooms experience the impact firsthand. In normal, normal times, coral has a relationship with tiny colorful algae that live in the coral tissues. The coral provides a home and the algae makes food, which it then shares with the coral. So warming ocean water though stresses the coral and also stresses the special relationship coral has with its algae. When oceans warm, coral expels that algae called zooxanthellae from its tissues. So let's take a look at these props. Think a little bit about what would happen if the water gets warm and we have a little video here. So these are just models. We have a model of two models of oceans. This one is that you're looking at now is warm. It's about 88 degrees. The other one with the healthy coral models in it are, it's probably about 78 degrees. Let's see what happens when we take a coral and put it into the warmer water. That's right. We have bleaching. So the warming oceans, um, in the warming oceans, we see the coral has lost its source of food and also the color that it got from that zooxanthellae algae. The coral is pale, the coral is hungry, but it may not be completely dead. So fortunately, by acting together, there are things we can do to reduce the burning of fossil fuel such as moving towards wind and solar sources for energy. California is already moving in a stepwise manner towards having our energy sector produce at least a third of our electricity from sources other than fossil fuels. And there you see a prop that we enjoy using on the floor. It was actually created by kids. We have our solar panel on a little Lego house with a flashlight and a fan that operates the windmill. So thanks to an environmentally engaged community, San Francisco specifically has launched Clean Power SF, which now provides 48% clean energy to all San Francisco homes. And you have an option of actually upgrading to 100% renewable energy. And many other Bay Area cities offer similar choices. So this is really good news. We can support this in our communities by staying informed about what is actually available to us by making it clear to our civic leaders that we expect clean energy delivered to our homes. So by changing how we get energy, we can protect our ecosystems near and far, including our coral reefs. So remember, we left that coral in sort of a warm bath. Let's go back to it and see what could happen if we work together as a community, maybe converting more and more to renewable energy. What can happen? We might be able to keep additional reefs from bleaching. We might even be able to save some bleaches, some reefs that are currently bleached. So there we're moving our coral that's pale and hungry back into a good temperature, cooler temperature. And there you see we have our color back, looks like a healthy reef. So that's our little example of um, a climate demonstration, climate conversation. At the Academy, we frame our message using research-based gnocchi techniques. So gnocchi is not an Italian dinner anymore. It is also a um, organization that is called National Network for Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. And I have the website up there. 
if you're interested, you might want to take a look. There are tons of resources, lesson plans, activities, um, photos, a lot of science um, on this website. And you can also do a um, self-paced class on it. So I've actually um, had the good fortune of, of participating in a six month study circle with organizations that are close to the California Academy geographically. So in our study circle, we had folks from the San Francisco Zoo, the Gulf of the Farallons, the National Marine Sanctuary, Marine Mammal Center, Mount Tamalpais State Park, Alcatraz Cruises, et cetera. And the good news about having all, the, all of us together is that now, as we have guests that might go to one of our institutions and then another, they hear the same message at both institutions. And I think that's extremely powerful. So what does this NOKI teach us? Well, basically, it's, it's fairly simple. Um, with a calm and hopeful tone, that's key. We want to avoid um, adding crisis and panic to people's lives, um, particularly now. In a calm and hopeful tone, there are three parts to any climate conversation, ideally. You would start with why does it matter? Why does climate change matter to society? Then go into how does it work? And then how do we improve the situation, which is probably the most important part. What are the solutions? What can we do? So with respect to why does this matter to society, Noki teaches us to lead with values that they have researched that are universally shared regardless of your religion, your political party, your age. Um, and what they have found is a particular value that is really shared by virtually everybody. And this, this value they call protection. And most everybody agrees with the statement, we must protect people and places from being harmed by the issues facing our environment. So this is a good place to start the conversation, sort of start where everybody is in agreement. Then getting into how does it work? It's, it's important for people to be able to connect the dots and get, have sort of an understanding of how climate change works. Um, it's complicated science, but by making it simple and using um, tested metaphors, it's possible to have a, um, an abbreviated understanding, an abbreviated conversation that leads to an understanding of how climate change works. And that's important so that the, um, the people you're talking to move towards the correct solution. So an example of a tested metaphor that makes, sort of makes it concrete and sticky in somebody's mind is the heat trapping blanket. And you heard me refer to that earlier in our little example with a coral. Then it, we want to be sure that we end by talking about potential solutions. And this can be done by um, talking about success stories, possibly, in, in the area and what, how we could maybe either mimic that or do that within our own areas. Um, for, and it's very important that we describe solutions that fit the scale of the problem. So at an individual level, we always used to say, okay, I'm gonna fight climate change, I'm gonna turn off my lights. Even the smallest kid at this point knows that that's not enough. And so moving from individual actions to um, actions that are maybe at the community level, um, Noki believes is the best place to be. So we talked about some of these solutions. We talked about renewable energy in our example, but um, another solution is just to continue the climate conversation. And um, age and background do not matter in this case. We've been using that coral renewable energy activity um, at nightlife at the academy with young adults. Um, it's, it's very engaging. We, we, it's a really good starting point for excellent conversations. And we use that, those same activities um, with, core, with, um, new, with third grade field trip programs, or we were last, last um, fall. We've also used, um, at the California Academy, we've used these little coral, um, color changing coral, very far 
um, far away from us. We've continued the climate conversation at the Caribbean Research and Management of Biodiversity. The Education Center, which is pictured here, um, has been working closely with the educators and scientists at the Cal Academy. And so that just continues the climate conversation with our partners far from the Academy. But as Paige actually said, we can also continue this climate conversation with our friends and families at home. And so um, I had this experience firsthand as I was preparing um, the, that activity with the coral polyps. This is my um, very artistic niece painting the first 3D printed corals with thermochromic paint, which is how we do that particular activity. So I didn't want to um, um, go without talking a little bit about climate change and how we're talking about climate during COVID. And I know all of our organizations are taking this pivotal moment to rethink how have we done things in the past and how do we move forward. So Noki, for example, is going back um, and doing additional studies. In these times of crisis, that protection value we talked about works really well. Um, it, 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 it has um, a lot of impact at this, at this um, point in time. But interconnection is another powerful, powerful value. Um, and that's because it's clear we're all in this together and COVID-19 has brought that home, right, to all of us. Um, it's important to, inter to highlight the intersection of some of the issues that we have today. For example, highlighting the intersection of climate action, health, and social and racial justice is also very powerful. And it's possible to look for success stories and solutions that address all three of those things. And I think that's something that um, we may want to talk about. Those success stories are out there. At the Academy, um, we've done a lot of virtual programming. We've moved, um, we've put online descriptions for how to make those little coral polyps out of Sculpey clay. Um, so you can do that in your own home. But we're also really moving um, towards a focus on the interconnection of humans and non-human nature. We want to get families outside their home. Um, even urban areas have lots of nature to explore. So we don't need to go to national parks or far away or other countries. We really, of course, we can't do that right now. But in reality, there were lots of families that could never do that. So we teach that ecosystems can be as large as a coral reef or as small as a sidewalk square in front of our house. And there are two applications um, that the Academy has been very um, instrumental with National Geographic in developing, and one is called SEEK, and another one is iNaturalist. And these were, um, in these you just take photos, the app helps you ID it, and the information is recorded so that scientists can gather more data on what is living where and when. And so this enables folks to be citizen scientists and um, being able to understand what is living where and when, of course, is key to understanding climate change. So on that note, I would like to thank you and pass it back to Paige. Thank you so much, Susan, for that fantastic and informative presentation. I really appreciate you sharing some of your interpretation tips, <coughs> as well as how you can engage visitors, not only K through 12, but lifelong learners. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to David Burton, where we'll hear about how a very different type of museum is also approaching this topic. Thank you, David. Hello, everybody. I'm David Burton with the Grace Hudson Museum in Ukiah, California. We're up in Mendocino County. It's a rural county. Less than 100,000 people live here. A lot of agriculture goes on, a lot of wine growing, sorts of crops. Um, so uh, our museum, um, this is the front of our museum, it's about 30 years old. 
Um, our collections are focused on the paintings of Grace Hudson, an early California painter, but we also have a wonderful collection of Pomo basketry and some material culture. And we have a wonderful arts community in Mendocino County that allows us to do all sorts of um, shows on contemporary art of Mendocino County. Um, so those are kind of the interpretive platforms, uh, three of the four interpretive uh, platforms that we have. The fourth is about the environment, but we don't really have collections about the environment. So how do we, how do we teach people about the environment? Well, Back in the mid, uh, about 2015 or so, the museum received a grant from the state of California. It was a nature education facilities program grant. And it allowed us to um, create on about a one and a half acres of our campus, something that we are calling the wild gardens. And the wild gardens are planted with exclusively with indigenous species of plants, uh, indigenous to Mendocino County and a lot of Northern California above the Bay Area. Uh, counties around here. Um, and so we're using this garden to teach people about environmental stewardship. Um, and um, one of the things we do is look at how exotic species try to outcompete indigenous species and what the consequences are for that. But we're also using this wild gardens to teach people about uh, traditional Pomo culture. Pomo Indians are lar the largest group of native peoples in, in our area. Uh, as well as Coast Miwok, but Pomo primarily. And given the fact that we have an extensive collection of Pomo baskets, we thought it'd be wonderful to be able to use the gardens to teach people about traditional Pomo lifeways. Uh, what we're looking at now is, uh, you see this water feature directly in the center of the screen is actually what we call a salmon screen. And it's a water feature that we built into the gardens to be able to tell people about the importance of salmon in Pomo diet. Uh, kind of just above the pond area, you'll see a, a sculpture. That's a metal sculpture, um, represents about twice the size of a normal Pomo fish trap basket uh, or salmon trap basket. Um, and so we're able to, to talk to people out in the gardens about what, what tools Pomo's use to fish for and techniques Pomo's use to, to fish for salmon. Uh, and um, uh, so we, again, we combine natural resources with Pomo culture. You'll notice in the very background, there's a physical structure. It's known as a brush arbor uh, we, we built in the gardens. That is something that is kind of a typical structure that Pomo's have used for a long time for various types of ceremonies and community gatherings. Uh, speaking of community gatherings, um, we had a blessing for the metal fish trap uh, basket. It was made by a Pomo sculptor who's also a welder. He knows metal very well. And uh, basically he modeled that metal basket, the basket sculpture, uh, from an actual fish trap basket made out of willow that we have in our collections. And we had about 70 or 80 people turned out on a summer evening to observe the blessing and to listen to the sculptor talk about how and why he made it and the way he made it. Um, this is a public program that was enormously successful for us um, to celebrate the inclusion of something new in our gardens and also, again, a teaching moment about Pomo culture and the materials from the environment from which the baskets were created. In addition to the wild gardens, we do have a vibrant exhibition program. We have a gallery devoted to temporary exhibitions. As I mentioned before, we don't have uh, materials in our collections that would allow us to create our own exhibitions about the environment. Uh, so we, are, we eagerly seek out traveling exhibitions that can help us do that. This is a show called Beauty and the Beast from, we had it in 2018. Uh, it's a, a show that's been tr uh, created and traveled by Exhibit Envoy, which if you don't know about Exhibit Envoy, they're a wonderful organization that creates small exhibitions for smaller institutions uh, and travels them around the state. Uh, this show was primarily a fine art show, fine art photography show uh, focused on uh, 
wildflowers, California wildflowers and wildflower habitats. But the actual theme of the show was about how climate change is putting in jeopardy those ecosystems that we enjoy so much in the springtime and summer when we see these wonderful displays of wildflowers. And the theme of the show was all about uh, learning more about climate change and how we can, uh, we as individuals and as communities can kind of redirect it in a more positive way and save these beautiful flowers that not only are wonderful to look at and give us much joy, but have a lot to do with the health of our ecosystems throughout the state. Here's another uh, image of the installation uh, from that exhibition. This is a very different image. It comes from uh, another traveling show we brought in that was organized by the C.N. Gorman Museum at UC Davis and was traveled by Exhibit Envoy. Uh, our people, our land, our images. And it is 30-some-odd um, uh, indigenous photographers from the United States, or North America, I should say, and some other parts of the world. Um, and this, is, this shot I particularly selected because there were a few shots in the exhibition that dealt with environmental uh, degradation um, and improper land management, and this, this is one of them. Uh, this is a, a photo of a strip mine in uh, O'Toole, Utah. Um, and uh, what the photographer has placed himself in the image, uh, wearing a traditional headdress from, from his tribe, and he sits on the edge of the strip mine overlooking what, what um, I think would safely be said is a wonderful example of how not to take care of the environment. Um, so uh, again, this show largely about indigenous photography of all kind, but it had, did have wonderful examples uh, that uh, would allow our audiences to learn more about um, the environment. I would say, you know, a big, a big part of what we do at the Grace Hudson Museum when we want to talk about climate is we partner with other organizations. We, uh, we have a small staff. We have three professional people on our staff. Uh, and so there's, there's a limit to everything we can do, but um, we like to seek out partnerships. And in this case, uh, Climate Action Mendocino, which is a very active uh, environmental group here in our county. Um, we, had, we had many conversations with them and they brought us uh, this film, Paris to Pittsburgh, uh, which I'll talk about a little more in a moment. But they, they brought an entire program to us, which was a screening of the film, which is about 60, 70 minutes. But they also brought with us a few presenters, uh, a poet uh, who did a wonderful sort of active poetry presentation on climate change, uh, as well as an expert on uh, waste management and talked about all sorts of things that everyday people can do to mitigate the impact of climate change. This is actually uh, the promotional shot that the producers of the film, Paris to Pittsburgh, used in their marketing um, for those of you who don't know it, um, what the film focuses on is in the aftermath of President Trump's withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Accord, the city of Pittsburgh basically said, well, we'll continue to do what we can to mitigate climate change with or without the federal government's involvement. And so this film really looks at the city of Pittsburgh and all the various ways they are adhering to the Paris Accords um, uh, and um, that's a film that, that uh, Climate Action Mendocino brought us. Here's another film they brought us to, uh, which is um, really uh, speaks more, more forcefully towards citizen science. And uh, this, this uh, film documentary called Tomorrow basically took us all over the world to see what communities in different parts of the world, whether they're wealthy or poor or somewhere in between are doing to um, in their own communities to mitigate climate change. This was another film that Climate Action Mendocino brought. This film, um, and uh, by the way, I might say that th when we do these film screenings, we usually get about 50 to 60 people. That's a large gathering um, in our county. Um, uh, so that, that's really a mark of success. This film is called A River's Last Chance, and it deals with the Eel River, which is a major river which has numerous tributaries here in Mendocino County. It runs from the mountains 
kind of in the eastern part of the county all the way to the ocean, but um, has been uh, damaged over a century, first by logging, the logging industry, and then by overfishing of salmon in, in the river. Uh, and this film, uh, and then more recently by illegal uh, marijuana farms that draw uh, water off the river and um, uh, leave a, a variety of much detritus in, in their wake. Um, this film was brought to us by an independent scholar of ecosystems and um, she helped us put together a program that not only included the screening of the film but uh, uh, a discussion afterwards. Um, this uh, shows a, a part of the, the audience that was at that particular screening. We had about 50 or 60 people for this screening, if I recall. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this picture is that the gentleman who is standing uh, and speaking on the right side of the frame is an elder of the Covalo uh, Rancheria here in kind of mid to northern uh, Mendocino County. And uh, he was a presenter uh, after the screening of that film, along with um, a woman who's the chair of the Inland Water and Power Commission, which has done a lot to try to uh, reclaim uh, the waters and health of the Yale River. This gentleman, the elder from Covalo, really is speaking about the importance of the river and the health of the river uh, and, and salmon, as well as all the biodiversity of the river and how important that is to the indigenous peoples of, of his area and why they participated uh, or partnered with the Inland Water and Power Commission to try to bring the river back to health. But one last film I wanna share with you here is about wildfires. Um, you know, it seems like the um, whole state of California is now subject to having wildfires. We, we in Mendocino, Mendocino County are right in the middle of it. And we've been affected by fires for the last three years uh, and, and even further back. But um, in fact, uh, right now we're in the aftermath of the uh, lightning fires that have been in Sonoma and Lake and county, counties and uh, we're full of smoke these days. But uh, this is another organization called LACO uh, and they deal in environmental, mitiga environmental mitigation. Uh, where they go in and try to clean up areas that have been harmed by um, polluters or by fires or by just about anything imaginable. Um, and uh, they, they brought us this film. It's about not only about the horror of wildfires, but again, steps that the average citizen can take to make their homes and communities safer from um, the potential of wildfire. Uh, and again, we, we screened this film and had a discussion with uh, so the, some fire authorities and land management folks. And again, just another example of partnering with other organizations to create programs uh, around issues that maybe your institution doesn't have full expertise on, but certainly has audiences that would be interested in this. Um, I selected this picture. Uh, it sort of mirrors the earlier picture I showed you of the beautiful wild gardens. Uh, but uh, what I'm showing you here is a darkened wild gardens. And this is an image I took at 12 noon last year uh, during the campfire that was raging in Calusa County, about 200 miles away. And the smoke from it uh, was hovering over us and just one more demonstration about how fire is all around our community and we have to be prepared for it every single day. The last slide I'm gonna share with you is another kind of program that we do uh, at the Grace Hudson Museum. It's a program we've been doing for, I think, 20 years now. Um, and it is, um, uh, we call it Praises to Tonansin. Uh, and it's a gathering we have in the middle of December, very close to the winter solstice, but also close to the celebration of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Uh, it has a special day. And um, uh, the Virgin of Guadalupe, who's based on an indigenous woman uh, in present day Mexico called Tonansin. Um, so uh, what we do is gather people, our artists primarily, poets, musicians, uh, uh, storytellers, and we have a, an evening where we gather, we share food, uh, and uh, we share our art. And the art is 
in, in, um, in honor of Tonantzin, in honor of the Virgin of Guadalupe, in honor of Mother Earth. And it is an artistic way that we, uh, we address the environment and the importance of uh, being good stewards of, of our Mother Earth and our ecosystems on which we depend. Um, so uh, with that, I return to the front of the museum and, and pretty much that's, that is my presentation and we look forward to if anybody has any questions in the aftermath. So back to you, uh, back to you Paige. Thank you so much, David. And thank you for sharing how a museum that is more art and culture focused can have really meaningful exhibits, programs, and dialogue around this issue. So we've had a chance to hear a little bit about some examples from exhibits, K through 12 field trips, public programs. So now for our last session, we'll turn it over to Libby Elwood, who's gonna focus a little bit on the research side and collections digitization and how all of that can help communicate climate change messaging as well. So thank you, Libby. Thanks, Paige. Thanks, everybody. It's been really exciting to be part of this panel and to hear about everything else that you all are working on. And let me put up my PowerPoint here. So as Paige mentioned, um, today I'll be sharing an example from the research and collection side of museums. This example will demonstrate how specimens in natural history collections are being used in and are really quite invaluable for, cl for climate change research. So it's not always easy to tell how climate change is impacting plants and animals, but one metric we can use is called phenology. And this is the timing of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena. And this can include annual events like when plants flower, when migratory birds arrive, or when insects emerge. So you're probably familiar with some of these even just from your own neighborhoods and from uh, the world around you. My work has been largely focused on plants. And when we analyze the dates that when, for example, trees and other plants leaf out, we can get a sense of when the growing season has begun in that area, and therefore when water and carbon are more actively cycling through the ecosystem. Similarly, we can look at flowering, and flowering reflects how reproductively healthy a plant is. So these two metrics of phenology are ways that we can understand how well an individual plant is doing, how well a population of plant is doing, and even how well an ecosystem is doing relative to um, its phenological state. So now the question is, how are leaf out and flowering affected by climate change? And this will give us a sense of how plants are affected both season to season, as well as over very long time periods, how changes in temperature, and, and as we're experiencing now quite warmer temperatures, how plants are reacting and being influenced by those changes in temperature. So to answer this question, we looked at thousands and thousands of herbarium specimens that had been collected from throughout the United States. And we coded each one with information about its phenology. So for example, whether there were leaves or seeds or flowers on that plant. And we did this with every specimen that we saw. When we compared this phenological information with temperature, we found that phenology checks temperature pretty closely, as you can see in this fairly simplified graph. And so I'll just walk you through this graph real quickly. On the bottom, on the x-axis, you'll see temperature. And then up on the vertical, you'll see months. And those lines going through it represent the different phenological events. So as temperature goes to the right on the bottom there, you see the slope going down representing an earlier phenological event. So as temperature gets warmer, phenology gets earlier. And, and again, you're probably experienced this too in a warmer year. Um, maybe things are a little bit different. Maybe things happen a little bit earlier and you may have noticed that. So what this has enabled us to do is to compare these uh, herbarium specimen data with other types of data, for example, observations and um, records of when phenology has happened in the past. And it shows us a few things. It shows us that yes, plants do track climate and they track temperature very closely. 
and that herbarium specimens are really strong ways for us to be able to do this. So you know that observational data are really important for us to record and for us to keep track of over long periods of time. But this information that we gather from things like plant specimens here are also really important. What's unique about specimens though, as compared to observational data, is that specimen data can bring us back hundreds of years. So we can go back into the 19th century, for example, and see when flowers were emerging then, when plants were leafing out then, and we could compare that to what the temperature was like at that time. So this gives us a much longer time series of information. And while climate change is obviously more recent than um, some of those data represent, it gives us a baseline for what plants were doing before climate change really took hold of that system. And then we could compare it to now to see if plants are, are reacting in different ways. So this, uh, this type of data we've come to realize is really quite invaluable for climate change research. So not only are those data important for understanding how plants are responding to climate change, but it can have downstream effects for the rest of the ecosystem as well. And when we think about things like this, we're, we have our eyes open to what's called an ecological mismatch. So plants have a lot of animal associates. You could think about the herbivores, the insects and other animals that eat those plants. You could think about pollinators and insects and other animals that are um, going around to the flowers once they're open and, and pollinating those flowers. Uh, and so if the, if the plant phenology is impacted, then you can imagine that the downstream users of those plants are also impacted. So those pollinators and those herbivores could likely also be impacted if they're active at different times of year, for example, if the plants are now flowering a lot earlier, but let's say the insects are not emerging at the same rate as early as the plants are that can have detrimental impacts for the insects. So these are things that we have our eyes out for when we're studying phenology as well. Ecological mismatch is very difficult to point to in most ecosystems, but it's something that we want to be aware of as we're doing our research. So in addition to researchers looking at specimens and gathering those phenological data, these data can also be collected by community scientists as well and members of the California Phenology Thematic Collections Network are making this possible. So through this network of collections all around California, researchers are using digital images of plant specimens to investigate how phenological change has happened in the biodiversity hotspot of California. And so you see this lovely image of um, poppies in the field, and we have these specimens that also serve as a uh, a counterpoint to those types of photographs. So we can use photographs and observational information from recent years and looking at specimens allows us to go much deeper in time to look at that phenology. So when we look at those specimens, often we have images of the specimens which can be found online. And once those images are online, then really anybody anywhere in the world can help us gather phenological data. So if I were to make that lovely herbarium specimen of this California poppy online, you, all of you would be able to tell me, yeah, there are some flowers on that. And this is an important phenological observation, an important phenological data point that we can add to our data set. So folks in the California uh, phenology network here are using platforms like Notes from Nature to engage people en masse in collecting these types of data from herbarium specimens. So if you go to notesfromnature.org and you look for the little poppy icon there and you click on that, you'll be taken to, um, to this platform that will request certain types of information that can be found on the specimen label or the specimen itself. And then through this process, many people will look at that image or several people will look at that image of, uh, of that plant and will provide the digital information relevant to it. And then those data are returned to the collection and the collections database. And then those data are made available to researchers, researchers doing um, uh, studies on phenology around California to see how California plants are impacted by changes in temperature that we've been experiencing. And again, these specimens allow us to look quite deeply in time to see how those changes have been taking place. 
So I invite you all to go to notesfromnature.org yourselves if you are working with volunteers, if you're working with students, even family members. Um, this activity is really quite engaging and enjoyable. And I'll also mention coming up a, a kind of grander version of just an individual going to Notes from Nature, and this is We Dig Bio. So We Dig Bio is worldwide engagement for digitizing bio collections. And this will be the sixth year of this event. During We Dig Bio, we collaboratively will work on transcriptions and other digitization activities related to specimens and mobilizing data for natural history collections. So during this time, you can go to wedigbio.org and, and see some of the activities that we do. But we have a very active community from all over the world that is working to make these data available through platforms like Notes from Nature. There are other platforms though in Australia and Europe, and you could find platforms in different languages and not just plants and not just related to phenology. It's just that it is specimen based. So you could find, um, projects related to insects, you could find ones related to birds and microorganisms and, and so forth. And so this is very applicable to lots of interests and lots of different types of audiences. So I, I encourage you to check out this event and it happens the third October of every year. So if you can't make it this year, be sure to mark your calendars for next year. We're also very active on social media and Twitter in particular, where we might challenge each other to say, hey, what's the oldest specimen you found? Or what kinds of interesting uh, specimens are you seeing in the collections that you're looking at? And so it really does help to build community and appreciation around our bio collections around the world. And lots of folks don't realize that research happens on these collections, that these collections are very active and a very important part of a lot of the research that's happening around climate change and conservation research. I want to um, take a second to thank the people that have also contributed to this research. This, a lot of the research and images from um, this talk have been taken from the, uh, the paper that's listed there. And I also leave my contact information. So please don't hesitate to reach out either now during this panel or anytime after. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Libby, and thank you for sharing the importance of preserving natural history collections, but also how these digitization projects make these collections so much more accessible. You don't just have to go to the museum in person to be able to make use of these resources. So it's really exciting to see what you're doing with iDigBio. So thank you again to our three fantastic panelists. Thank you for your informative presentations. This concludes the recorded part of the panel and we look forward to seeing you in just a moment for the Q&A. Thanks everyone.